It's been less than a century since foreigners stumbled upon this Pacific island paradise. We've just entered a, uh, what they call a fighting zone, basically a local war zone. The last two villages we've gone through had had fights last year. We're now in an area where the fight is still carrying on. My name is Sam. Oh, my name is Sam Sufi. There's still no functioning state in the highlands of Papua New Guinea. Stone Age ritual violence has become a nightmare, fueled by drugs and guns. Will you, uh, will you guard the car? Every village in Papua New Guinea has a band of warriors. This lot had attacked their neighbours the night before I turned up. Is it okay? They're happy to talk to us. Have there been any casualties on each side? Both sides. Both sides. Both sides. Five, yeah. Five on this side. This side. And that side? Four on that side. Four, four on that side. Now this group here only have homemade uh, shotguns and things like that. They're saying the other side has got M16s, AK-47s. These men, as, as we can see, have got axes, they've got machetes, they've got bows and arrows, but that's no match for people with uh, M16s who then come in and uh, they're saying we don't want to lose any more lives from our community. Larson saying that uh, the government isn't doing enough, in fact it's not doing anything, and that what it should do is set up an organisation that can sweep up all the guns and then stop it coming into the province. Suddenly, scouts reported there was a danger of a counter-attack. Right. Right. Okay. So were we they're saying we shouldn't stay long. Yeah, we shouldn't stay longer. We didn't know that we were driving straight up the middle of uh, what is a front line in a tribal war. It's been going on for five months and already claimed nine lives and numerous wounded. The Stone Age tradition of fighting with bows and arrows had strict rules and low body counts. Modern weapons have brought massive destruction. This used to be a uh, petrol station serving a community along with the stores that were alongside it, a community of hundreds and hundreds of people. Now for several miles in every direction, the land is completely abandoned. We're not out in the middle of the jungle, but the outskirts of Warbeg, the capital of Enga province. The local clinic sees most of the casualties. Uh, it's straight, straight on, isn't it? Hi, I'm Dr. Colombangi. Ah, Dr. Sam Kiley, hello. Hello, Sam. This is the guy who was uh, with a big gun wound. This guy, gunshot wound. He's one of days where I'm then. Uh, wh wh when was he uh, brought in? About a week ago. About a week ago. From fighting down the valley? Yeah, right. along the road. That's right. Along the road that we came from Mount that's Hagen right. to here. So. Um, and do you, do you see a lot of um, uh, victims of uh, violence? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's it, endemic. It's endemic. How long has your tribe been fighting against the people that shot you? How much I never? Four years. Ago. Almost four years of yeah. fighting. Yeah. Kevin here was wounded in the abdomen. He was shot by one of his tribal enemies during a brief ceasefire. He was ambushed. Um, 
he's here with his friend. Um, his friend is reluctant to admit that what will happen next, uh, according to everybody else around here, including other people in the ward, is that um, there will be revenge attacks. This potentially rich province has been ravaged by the cycle of killings and revenge. I met with Bilalo, a tribal elder. His brother was murdered in fighting with his neighbours, a rival clan. So this is where you buried Leo? Yes. The last of the 54 people that you lost in the fighting, is yes. that right? Yes. Are you strong enough to take revenge, your tribe? Yeah, we got enough, you know, firearms and everything. We yeah. are fully equipped. There was no ceasefire here. The two sides were just taking a breather. Bill agreed to introduce me to some of his warriors. This is a high-powered automatic rifle. How long have you had it? Four years, five years. Did you have to spend a lot of money on it? Was it expensive? Thirty thousand kina, six hundred pounds. How much is a bullet? Twenty-five for one. Twenty-five for one. It's a fiver. It's five pounds a shot. Might explain why they've only got two. I wondered if their face paint was entirely traditional. So you learn how to do the... They've learned to do the camouflage from watching the Rambo movies. And in fact, the, the big fighter in each community is called Rambo. That's become a, a title, isn't it? Who is, who is your Rambo? Is that you? That's Peter. So Peter is the village Rambo. And that is uh, not a nickname, that's a title. Peter, has the, um, the number of people getting killed and the level of violence and the rules of fighting, have they changed since guns came? Peter's saying that in the old days when they fought there would be a, a restricted area, a fighting zone if you like, and that um, when there were house burnings and that kind of thing, they were very specific about whose house got burnt and they didn't kill civilians and they kept the casualty levels low. Now that the guns have come, when there are attacks, people go berserk. They've got high power guns and they just hose down whole villages, torch every house they can get to and shoot women and children. So the whole traditional structure of uh, solving problems through small-scale traditional fighting with traditional mostly non-lethal weapons has been turned on its head. That evening I met with Bill's mother. Her face paint was traditional, a sign of mourning. His father's pain was silent. Just in case anybody thought that there was no grief attached to the killings that go on here, Patricia, as a traditional expression of her grief, cut off the last top two joints of her left hand, her index finger and the one next to it, and she carries them around with her in a little pot just as a sign of the very deep pain that she feels for the loss of Leo. Ooh, it's hard. I popped into the local cinema for a shoot 'em up matinee. Fighting, killing and house burning has pushed right to the edge of Warbeg City. I wondered what the authorities were doing to stop it.
Hello there. Sam, I'm Sam. Sam Kiley. Welcome. I'm here with the Governor and the Minister for Transport and Civil Aviation. Gentlemen, what, is, what has caused this explosion in, in, in a tradition of fighting, I understand, but why is it all suddenly restarted? Well, what I, what I uh, believe is that it is the presence of uh, a very strong tradition society uh, in the progress of changing to a modern society. All of a sudden, we are leaping from a very strong traditional cultural background to a very new, uh, unexperienced way of life. And obviously, uh, one would expect us problems. Some outside analysts, and indeed some Papua New Guineans, have warned that unless the law and order issues are addressed, both in terms of tribal fighting and high-level corruption, that Papua New Guinea is in danger of becoming a failed state. The structure, the authority in the village, uh, has sort of broken down. Now somehow we, as a government, we have got to step in quickly and establish authority. Uh, because uh, the so-called Rambo, Rambos at the moment think that they can do anything they want. Why is it then that the police are not going out and stopping people getting killed, stopping houses being burnt, churches, schools, valuable resources. People have saved their whole lives to build a permanent dwelling and then boom, in one night it's gone. I mean here, here in Inga, it's just pure slackness. We, we can't uh, defend. See, our provincial government has done a lot for the police. We have maintained all their, their residences, uh, you know, here in Wabeg. Uh, we have given them vehicles. We are supporting them on, uh, you know, purchasing ammunition and all that. So they've got no, no reason, who, uh, you know, no excuse for not stopping that, that tribal fight. As far as we're concerned, that was pure slackness. I was sure the police wouldn't agree, so I popped into their local headquarters. Right, well, <clears throat> I've just tried to talk to the cops. Uh, the provincial police commissioner is under interrogation in the neighbouring provincial capital and the local station commander was arrested by police from the Port Moresby, from the national capital, over an incident in which a policeman shot dead a local who was allegedly holding up a, a goods vehicle heading uh, through Wabeg. While the politicians passed the buck back and forth, Bill had contacted his enemies. Incredibly, they agreed to meet us. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> It's very difficult to uh, believe, but we are actually being now taken to the tribal enemies of Bill, the very people who killed his brother Leo. Sangai. Sangai. Hi, Sam. My name is Sam. I think you're the boss. I'm the boss. Yeah, I can tell. So, uh, this is your AK? Yeah? yeah? This is my AK. Uh, AK. My name is Men are the Vijamak. You are the Vijamak. And are the Vijamak. The refrain everywhere here is that fights start over a fight over land, most importantly, but then it could be over pigs, a marital squabble, any excuse really. But basically, do you enjoy it? Oh, I. I'm by live room. Yeah. The game. <laughs> it's, it's like rugby. You said like rugby. Game. It's like rugby. Even though people get killed. So they they they're saying that yeah, tribal fighting is like rugby. It's a game. It's a sport. They enjoy it. They feel sorry when people get kip killed, but they uh, bury them and move on, carry on fighting. 
It can take years before one clan or tribe or village settles its disputes with another. But when the death toll is very heavy, the negotiating process is close to impossible. Compensation payments are crippling. Just arrived for a reconciliation. In fact, a ritual paying of compensation. I hope tomorrow there'll be a ritual exchanging of pigs, slaughtering of pigs and feasting to allow hundreds and hundreds of people who've been refugees for half a decade to return to their homes. The negotiations over compensation broke down and there was no reconciliation. These people trudged home to face another round of fighting. Several hundred had died in five years and this heavy death toll brought by firearms had made the price of peace too high. How did the fighters pay for their guns? The answer was growing in the hills. We're high up in the mountains, uh, right on the Bismarck Range, in fact. That, that's the Bismarck Range, just here. We've seen our first little uh, pot plant. They're planted, they tell me, very high up in the mountains, deep in the rainforest. One way up, one way down. Uh, because that way they can ambush the police if they come and try and chop their pot plants down. Good? Yeah. Garden fresh organic weed. Uh, get, last time we were going to plant garden. This is not happening. We planted marijuana last week. This is uh, Doe. This is his garden. Although he's growing 35 kilograms of uh, marijuana here, he used to actually plant the whole hillside with it. He's only just harvested quite a lot of it. It takes about 50, he tells me, to buy an AK-47. Those children help in the harvest. Got money, got problem. Long school fee, education. Uh huh. Getting expensive. Yeah, expensive. Now maybe a month plus. Um, COVID and maybe a weight loss season long. Patrick's saying that um, school fees have gone up in in cost. And uh, this is an extremely useful cash crop because unlike coffee, which has only one harvest a year, this grows all year round and you can get multiple harvests. So uh, as the centre of the New Guinean state weakens through an inability to deliver basic services, so the farmers are growing drugs in order to buy their way out of poverty and educate their kids and indeed arm themselves in what's becoming a kind of um, rural arms race between tribes. When the marijuana is brought down from the hills, it begins its journey in the globalised trade in drugs and guns. It's carried by porters across Papua New Guinea, often down routes following gas and oil pipelines carved through the jungle, down to the coast and sold to Australia. This is Daru, which is the port where the marijuana that's grown up in the highlands is put into small craft and then smuggled into Australian waters in exchange for hard cash and firearms. Expecting to meet us, isn't he, anyway? He knew we were coming. 
We've just landed in the village of Mabudawan, which is uh, directly opposite Australian territory. But this is the route that the uh, drugs and the guns take back and forth. I'm hoping to meet with the smuggling contact. How long have you been doing drug smuggling? Uh, since I was a kid, I've been engaged in this drug smuggling. Is it profitable? Yeah, very profitable. Do you also uh, exchange this marijuana for guns? Yeah, of course I do. You do? Mm. But is there, are there a lot of guns that come in? Yeah. Where yeah. do they get sold? I mean, why do you bring in guns? Where's the market for them? The markets are up in the highlands for the tribal fight. So for an AK-47, for example, how many kilos do you get? Well, it's a high power. You're looking at 60 to 50 kilograms. But on the Papua New Guinea side, is there much difficulty for you? Well, in Papua New Guinea, it's not that difficult because our system is very weak in monitoring such activities, illegal activities. Does it worry you that these guns are used in tribal fighting and destabilizing the country? making it more dangerous to live here? Well, the person who needs the gun at the end is not me. So the smuggler shares the morals of the international arms industry. Papua New Guinea's population emerged from the Stone Age only decades ago. But contact with the outside world has not managed to dampen the local passion for tribal fighting. It has fueled a demand for imported modern weapons. And they're paid for by the West's growing passion for drugs.